pastor here at the well if you are joining us for the first time welcome if you're joining us online or on the app be sure to fill out the digital connect card and let us know you're here how we can be praying for you if you have the app here and you're a regular attender you can go ahead and fill out our digital connect card with any prayer requests that you have we would love to be praying for you so we are coming to the end of our series on earth is in heaven it's been quite a series right some of you have been here all these weeks you're like Whew, okay i'm you kind of feel a little beat up by it so we're gonna end with a bang politics you know the thing that everyone's like okay thanksgiving's coming how am i gonna talk about it and uh i wanna if you don't know maybe you don't that we live in a very polarized political environment right now maybe you hadn't realized that but we do and i have a few stats to to share with you over 70 percent of both Republicans and Democrats believe that the other side are bullies that are just trying to impose their beliefs on the nation. So, you know, both sides think the other side is a bully. That definitely sets up a good environment for dialogue and, you know, rational thinking and discussion. Uh, nine in 10 people believe a victory from the other party will result in lasting harm. So again, everything feels like it's so, uh, everything's on the line and everything could just fall apart and it's catastrophic if the other side wins and ideologies are getting more extreme there's a thing going on called the big sort right now meaning that people are intentionally moving to areas of the country where they feel like oh people vote like i vote so what they're finding is red zip codes are getting redder and blue zip codes are getting bluer so we're sorting ourselves out as to who we're gonna even reside with and see on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and then one in five americans say that they had a, ne a relationship negatively affected by the 2020 election. And I've shared that stat with some friends and our staff, and they're like, that feels real low. That feels real low. And some of you are like, listen, I have like five relationships, like five to one that have been negatively impacted by the 2020 election. And so we just see political violence is on the rise. The, the assumption that political violence might be necessary is on the rise. And the church has not been immune to this. The church has been deeply affected, the American church, by the polarization that we are experiencing. In fact, it is the number one reason why pastors are leaving the ministry right now. Two in five pastors in the last two years have considered leaving full-time ministry because of the polarization in their congregations. They're finding it nearly impossible to shepherd communities. They feel like they can't make anyone happy, and they're just kind of getting beat up by both sides. In a study done in 2019, 25 percent of young people have left the church completely because of political stances and i i believe that if you were to do that that survey in 2022 it would probably be higher than that but a quarter of our young people are leaving the church because of the church's stance on politics i know many of you have left churches because of political stances within the church uh, and then the reality is fewer people in america see the church as a positive force within society two-thirds of americans think the church should stay out of politics uh, and then more than half of the nation actually looks to the government to bring about national, bring about uh, societal change that will benefit everyone. They've stopped looking to the church. They don't feel like the church is necessarily a positive force. Our reputation is going down. And so we have to deal with politics. We have to deal with how we approach politics, how we approach those who hold different political convictions than we do the effectiveness of politics, whether we believe they're effective or not, and really what it means to be a good citizen of the nation we reside in and be a follower of Jesus. Because if we don't sort this out, it is affecting the witness of the gospel. It is affecting the witness of the church. And so we have to talk about it, and we're going to. And we're going to look today at the life and teaching of Jesus to help us navigate this. And we're going to be looking at three questions. Hopefully we'll give some satisfying answers around these three questions that are probably on top of mind as a follower of Jesus when it comes to politics. They are, what is politics good for? How should Christians be involved in politics? And how should I vote? So let's look at that first one. What are politics good for? Again, politics has to do with the governing of the state, affairs of the state. And as we said last week, Paul makes it really clear that God has a role for governments right now in the world. There's a, there's a purpose for governments. He says this in Romans 13. He says, every person should place themselves under the authority of the government. There isn't any authority unless it comes from God. And the authorities that are there have been put in place by God. So anyone who opposes that authority is standing against what God has established. People who take this kind of stand will get punished. The authorities don't frighten people who are doing the right thing. Rather, they frighten people who are doing 
Wrong. Would you rather not be afraid of authority? Do what's right, and you will receive its approval. It is God's servant given for your benefit. But if you do what's wrong, be afraid, because it doesn't have weapons to enforce the law for nothing. It is God's servant put in place to carry out his punishment on those who do what is wrong. And so we would say God is well aware that the world is broken and that sin is a reality, right? And so governments, as we said last week, have been put in place, worldly authority has been put in place to contain and deter sin and evil in cooperation. The intention is that they will cooperate with God's will in the world, but they have the power not to. So it's like parenting, right? When you have a child, you have been given the gift of the authority of being a parent, right? You don't have to ask God. You can just be a parent. He's given us the ability to raise children. You can do that in cooperation with God's will or not, right? And we know that there's lots of parents who don't. There's lots of people we think you should not be in charge of another human being, but they get to, right? God doesn't just come in and usurp their authority and take it away. And so it's the same with governments that hopefully God will cooperate with God's will and, and do what God intends governments to do, but they might not always. And what's the government at its best is meant to set up social agreements and, and navigate social agreements where we agree to, to operate a certain way for the benefit of everyone else, right? So take, for example, in our nation, driving. We have a social agreement that is enforced by the government around speed limits. When you drive on a road, there's a number there, and you think within like five, 10 miles, you know, some of you 15, uh, you think that I, I am operating with everyone else in mind, right? Hopefully, like we are, we are agreeing that this is an appropriate speed on this road for the benefit of most people, right? And the government is there both to help us navigate that, but also to enforce when someone does not, right? When someone chooses not to honor the social agreement, because it only works if we all agree to it. If everyone starts driving 100 miles an hour on every road, the government cannot arrest all of us, and there, there goes anarchy, right? That's not what we're looking for. So, but you know, when you're driving on the road, and you're like, you know, five, 10 miles within the speed limit, and someone just like flies past you, what's the first thing you think? You think, I hope there's a cop up ahead. I hope you get the biggest ticket you've ever seen. Why? Because they're not operating according to the social agreement. And that's what government is there for, to say, we've all agreed to behave this way, and it's our job to enforce that when people act outside of that. So government, their greatest tool is fear, right? Fear of punishment, power of the sword, as we've, t as we've talked about. Governments are not established on love. That's not their job. You don't see the, the, the speed limit and think, wow, that makes me think that my government loves me, that they set this road at 55 miles an hour. I'm so glad. No, you think, okay, that's the law. I don't want to get a ticket. I don't want to you know, get in trouble, so I'm going to try to stay as close to it as I can. That's the role of governments, but governments are limited. God has never intended governments to save the world and to save humanity, right? Tried it with Israel, didn't work. They had laws from God. God was their ruler, and it still didn't work. And so when we look at the life of Jesus, especially two scenes from the life of Jesus, we see what government is not good for. Because remember, there are two different kingdoms. There's the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God, and they're not the same. One is not bringing about the other. And so the first scene from Jesus's life is right at the beginning of his ministry, when he's in the desert and he's tempted by the devil. And we read this, then the devil took him up and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. I will give you the glory of these kingdoms and authority over them, the devil said, because they are mine to give to anyone I please. I will give it all to you if you will worship me. So the devil says, I have all the authority of all these kingdoms. You can have them. You can have them, and you can establish any government you want. You can put all the people in charge that you want. You can set the right laws you want. You can make it the most just system across the world if you want. Small compromise, you have to worship the devil, you know, but he says, you can do it. And what does Jesus say? No, no. I mean, obviously there's a devil part of that, but this is not his plan. And the truth is, the New Testament writers tell us that not much has changed, even post-resurrection. John says this, we know that we are children of God and that the world around us is under the control of the evil one. Uh, Ashley brought this up in our podcast this week. We'll talk more about it, I'm sure, this week. But in Revelation 13, John is writing a scathing review of the empire and the forces that fuel it, right? So to assume that we can bring the kingdom of God, that we can advance the kingdom of God by setting up the right worldly structures, we see that's not Jesus's plan. That's not what government is good for. And then the next account that we see with Jesus 
is after he feeds over 5,000 people, everyone is impressed, and we read this. When the people saw that he had done a miraculous sign, they said, this is truly the prophet who is coming into the world. Jesus understood they were about to come and force him to be their king, so he took refuge again alone on a mountain. And so the people, they had been waiting for a political messiah. They had been waiting for someone in the vein of Moses to come, be their ruler, and establish the kingdom of Israel once again. And they see Jesus, and they see these signs, and they think, this is it. He's our guy. We're going to make him our king, and we're going to throw out Rome. That's what we're going to do. And Jesus sees that and says no, and he, he runs, and he hides. And so what we see is Jesus also, he doesn't take control of all the governments to set them up in a just way, and he doesn't seek a worldly position of power in order to establish his own government and then let, let that goodness spread from there. He does not use worldly power to advance his kingdom. And so when we answer this question, what is politics good for? Well, it is good for something. It is good for law and order. It is good for these social agreements and enforcing these social agreements for the, for the benefit of the most people, that we're going to operate in a way that we are not going to harm one another. We're not going to murder each other. We're not going to drive drunk. We're not going to you know, hurt children. That's government at its best. What is it not good for? It is not good for establishing and advancing the kingdom of God. right? So that brings us to our next question. How should Christians be involved in politics. And again, we go to a particular scene in Jesus' life that brings us a lot of insight. Because if we think we live in a like, political tense time, Jesus did too. It was real tense. Tensions were high because Israel was occupied by Rome, and they were reminded of that all the time. Rome was really good at keeping the peace as long as you didn't mess with them and you didn't try to usurp their authority. So they made sure that everybody knew who was in charge. And one of the ways they did that was through the poll tax. And this, is, this isn't like a, a tax in order to vote. They couldn't vote. This was a tribute to Caesar for everybody to remember who was in charge. And only non-Roman citizens had to pay the poll tax. So again, it was this little like dig to be like, he's your emperor, pay tribute to him. You, you are not in charge, he is. And the Jews hated the poll tax. This was incredibly divisive among them because they had to pay it with a certain coin, right? Jews would use coin that didn't have any images on them because that was, they, they believed to have a graven image was idolatrous. But to pay the poll tax, you had to use a denarius, which was either a silver or gold coin, and it had Caesar's face on it, and it had an inscription that said, Caesar, the son of God, right? And so they hated this coin. They hated holding it. They hated using it. They hated having to pay this tax with Caesar's coin. And so there was great division over this poll tax. And so the Pharisees, they're trying to trap Jesus, and they think, we've got him. We've got the perfect question to ask him. And so we read, then the Pharisees met together to plot how to trap Jesus into saying something for which he could be arrested. And they sent some of their disciples, along with the supporters of Herod, to meet with him. Teacher, they said, we know how honest you are. You teach the way of God truthfully. You are impartial and don't play favorites. Now tell us what you think about this. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? So they are intentionally setting Jesus up. The Pharisees send their disciples so that they don't look like they're behind it. The disciples are, are students. So they're like, teacher, we're genuinely asking you as a teacher of the law what you think. And they send the supporters of Herod, known as the Herodians. And Herod was a government official for Rome. So the Herodians are on the lookout for anything that reeks of sedition, anything that's going to subvert the Roman Empire, right? So they've set Jesus up and they think, perfect question. He can't get out of this time because if he says yes, you, of course you should pay the Roman tax. Well, now he's pro-Rome and he's going to lose all of his followers. People are going to be so angry and they're going to see him for who he is. If he says no, well, that is sedition. That's treason. He'll get arrested and probably killed. 30 years earlier, Judas the Galilean had risen up a whole revolt against the poll tax, telling people not to pay it because it was idolatrous. This was in Jesus' lifetime, and he was killed, and all of his followers were killed, and people were still paying the tax, right? So he, they, they think, we've got him. He's either going to say yes, or he's going to say no, and one way or another, he's in trouble. But as Jesus often does, he flips the whole thing. And he says to them, but Jesus knew their evil motives. You hypocrites, he said, why are you trying to trap me? Here, show me the coin used for the tax. And when they handed him a Roman coin, he asked, whose picture and title are stamped on it? Caesar's, they replied. 
Well then, he said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. So the first thing he does is he exposes their hypocrisy. You know, that means, to, a hypocrite means to be one who is masked, their masked intentions. And he says, give me one of these coins, right? He doesn't have one on him because Jews aren't supposed to carry this coin. But you know who does? The people asking the question, right? And so immediately he's showing them, we're not all that concerned about whether we should be handling this money or using this money or not. You have one on you in the temple, religious authorities, right? You shouldn't have it with you. So they give him this coin and he holds it up. And he says, whose inscription on it? Whose picture is on this? And of course they say Caesar. And then his answer, it stuns them. But later it says, they were so stunned they walked away in silence because he holds this coin up, this little coin, and he's in the big temple. You have to picture this, right? This temple that is devoted to God, meant to reflect the majesty of God. And he holds up this little coin and he says, well then, give back to Caesar. That word give means to give back. When we hear render to Caesar or give to Caesar, it means give back to Caesar what Caesar's and give back to God what's God's. And why they're so stunned is that Jesus separates the kingdoms because for them there was one kingdom. God's kingdom was an earthly kingdom that was going to overtake the Roman kingdom. One of them had to win out. And Jesus, imagine, picture this. Here is the actual son of God who is the full impression of God. We're said he is the, he is the visible image of the invisible God holding up this coin with a false claim on it, basically treating it with disgust, saying this, it's not the currency the kingdom of God is dealing in. So you know what? Give back to Caesar the, Caesar's coin because it's not the same as the, as the kingdom of God and what we're dealing with. He separates the kingdom. And they had never seen that. Two different kingdoms. And in doing that, he starts to show us how we are as followers of Jesus to operate within worldly kingdoms. We are not called to overthrow them. That's not our job, to be overthrowing governments. It is not our job to be devoted to them, to blindly follow them. But we are to give back to the worldly kingdoms what belongs to them. Sure, pay your taxes to them. Give Caesar his coin. But that coin, it doesn't really matter when it comes to the kingdom of God. It's not competing. And that's why Paul, as he's working out this ethic of what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus in a worldly kingdom, he says, be good citizens. He says this, remind the believers to submit to the government and its officers. They should be obedient, always ready to do what is good. And so the first thing he says is that we should obey our leaders, that we should submit to our leaders. He does not say that we should blindly be devoted to our leaders. He doesn't even say that we should blindly follow whatever they do. That word to submit, to obey, means that we acknowledge the authority, the worldly authority that they hold. We respect the control that they have. And remember, Paul and the early church is not under a very good government. It is not a just government that's acting on their behalf. It's a really unjust, brutal government. And he says, you are, you are to respect the control that they have. But he also says, and be ready to do good. Because remember, the early Christians weren't like, well, we just have to follow the rules. No, they hid other believers who were being sought after, who were trying to, people were trying to arrest them and kill them. They hid them and, and got them out of town, right? So they weren't just blindly doing whatever the government said, but they were ready to do what was good. But they acknowledged the control that worldly authorities have. It's not yours to subvert. Submit to that. And Peter goes on to say this, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. And Peter's saying you should stand out as model citizens. You should be the best neighbors. But you know what you should be known for? Your goodness, not your activism. You should be known that your life is so good. You love people so well. You live the ethic of Jesus with such integrity that even if people don't like you because you don't really fit in, you're foreigners and exiles, not really where you belong, people can't help but think well of you. And we see that in, in the book of Acts. It talks about how even though no one understood them and didn't really like them, they live such good lives, people just held them in high regard anyways. So we're called first to obey the authorities of this world, to submit, to recognize the control that they have been given. And then Peter goes on to say this, honor everyone, love the family of believers, have respectful fear of God, honor the emperor. And so he says to honor our leaders. So we're to obey or submit to our leaders, we're to honor our leaders. Now let me be clear, that word honor means to respect. And it starts off, that phrase starts off with honor everyone, right? Respect everyone. And then he goes on to say, respect the emperor. 
honor his humanity, recognize that he is made in the image of God. He does not say be devoted to the emperor. The only people he says be devoted to are one another, Jesus and the, and the church and the kingdom that he's bringing about. That's it. But honor, respect, and let me be clear, saying that about the emperor at the time is huge because the emperor was Nero, and Nero was brutal. He was awful. He literally scapegoated Christians. He took them, lit them on fire as lamps to light up the city, right? He was a terrible persecutor of the church. One of the most brutal persecutions the church ever experienced is under Nero. When John is writing Revelation about the beast and all that, go back, we did a sermon on Revelation a couple years ago, he's talking about Nero. Nero was terrible. And so what is Peter saying? He says, honor, respect that even Nero is made in the image of God, that he is a human being. Respect his dignity as a human being, even if he's not respecting yours, even if he is terrible and brutal and awful. You are called to not be devoted, to honor him. How many people in the church need to hear that? Honor someone, even if they are awful. Even if you have a leader who you, you don't like, you don't like what they think, you don't like what they do, you don't even like how they talk or behave, you're still called to see them as a human being made in the image of God. We are called to respect everyone, even those acting as our enemy, right? And then the last thing, Paul says this. I urge you, first of all, to pray for all people. Ask God to help them intercede on their behalf and give thanks for them. Pray this way for kings and all who are in authority so that they can live peace, so we can live peaceful and quiet lives marked by godliness and dignity. And so the last thing he says is we should pray for our leaders, not for our leaders to have power, not for our leaders to win, not for their political platform to be enacted. Pray that they would use the authority that they have in a way that brings about peace, that brings about quietness, which means tranquility and undisrupted life an undisturbed life. Think about how many people in our world today need that prayer for their governments, that their governments would act in a way that doesn't disturb their lives. We wouldn't have such a huge refugee crisis of people having to flee governments because they are not acting that way. They're not using their worldly authority in that way. And he says, so that it results in dignity of all people, that all people recognize their respect for one another, and that we could live in godliness, that we, could, that we could honor Christ in the way that we live. So we should be praying, not for our leaders to be victorious, but for whoever is in charge to use the power that they have in a way that brings about peace, tranquility, and allows for dignity and godliness in people's lives. So that's how we are to participate in, in politics. How should we be involved? Well, we should not be looking to overthrow, subvert, you know, replace governments. We should not be devoted and blindly following governments. That's not where our loyalty is, but we should be, we should be uh, obeying and submitting to worldly authority, not blindly. You know, again, the, the church didn't just hand people over because the Roman authorities wanted them. They knew what was good and what was not, but they should be ready to do what is good. We should be, we should be the best neighbors known for our goodness. We should be the best citizens known for how much we care for one another. We should honor our leaders, meaning that we, we recognize the humanity in every person, even if they are not acting the way God wants them to act. And we should pray for our leaders to use their authority in a way that brings about goodness, that cooperates with God's will, right? And so that brings us to our last question. How should I vote? I know some of you are like, okay, how's this lady going to tell us to vote? You know, am I, am I staying or am I leaving, right? Let me say again, government has a place in society. It absolutely does. We need government to help us Keep law and order, keep things under control, you know, to punish those who choose to violate the social contract. We absolutely need that. But here's the truth. The church has relied on government and systems of the world to bring about societal change that we are called to bring about. We have relied too much on politics to do what the church is called to do. And yes, I mean, your vote, it's wonderful that we live in a system that we have a say. That is, that is a gift. We know that a lot of our brothers and sisters around the world do not. Christians are still the number one persecuted group in the world. Many of them live in places where they don't have a say at all about their safety or how they conduct themselves. So we are, we are grateful for that. But here's the reality. Laws do not change people's hearts and minds. They never have. Israel had laws from God himself, the best laws at the time, and it still didn't set up a godly nation. It still didn't create a world that was changed, right? And so when Jesus has this interaction with the Pharisees about the law, 
And remember, the Pharisees were devoted to God's law. They were experts in it. They believed that if they got it right, if they lived pure lives according to the law, devoted to God's way, then the Messiah would come and Israel's glory would be restored. And Jesus has some very sharp words for the Pharisees and the leaders of his time. He says, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You, have pra- you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides. You strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. He says, you are obeying the letter of the law. Like, you're tithing more than you even need to tithe. You're, you're like right in there, but you're missing the whole point. Because here's the reality. You cannot legislate someone to value or love justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You can't change someone's heart to love and value those things just by setting the right laws. Now, Jesus doesn't say, get rid of the law, no big deal, stop it, doesn't have a purpose. He says, no, you should, that's fine. You should still be tithing. Follow the law. But what he shows us is you can have, you can be following all the right laws, all the right rules, living by the way that you think you're supposed to and miss how God wants you to live. You can live counter to how God wants you to live. And we need to hear this. The church needs to hear this in America. We as Americans need to hear this over and over again. The law, getting all the right laws. If you got all your people that you support voted in and they put all the laws in, in, in the land, into place that you thought should be there that would set everything right, it's not going to change how people think and feel. It never has. They have a place. But if we are relying on our vote to change the world, we are mistaken. And let me also be clear, there is no party that is aligned fully with God's kingdom. Zero. Any, it doesn't matter if you're Republican, Democrat, Freedom, Green Party, whatever other parties out there, anyone that claims to be God's party, you should be incredibly suspicious. Because every party has some things that we can agree with and has many things that we should be suspicious of, things that we should bring into challenge, things that we should say, I'm not comfortable with that. Every party and very intelligent people can be thoughtful and think through how they, how they believe that we should solve society's problems and arrive at different solutions. Right? You can arrive at different sides of the aisle thoughtfully. You absolutely can. But any party that starts saying, if you don't vote this way, you can't possibly love Jesus, you should run. And anyone who starts framing their political opponent as an enemy and starts to claim anyone who thinks a certain way is evil and aligned with evil, we also should run. We, are to, we were told last week, our enemies are not one another. It is the powers and principalities which rule every single kingdom, right? Even ours, there's powers and principalities. We must be aware of that. We should run. And you've heard me say this before if you've been around here, but when we are talking about political parties, no matter where we tend to lean, our language should always be them and not we. They and not we. They think this. They believe this. You are not a Democrat and you are not a Republican or any other thing. You are a follower of Jesus who might happen to align with one party or another. But if we start using we around political parties, we must question our allegiance. Right? You, you can vote however you want. You can lean however you want, but we should always be saying they because we should always be standing outside of it a bit. Saying, well, this is where I, I, I agree with them the most, but I, that could change depending on how the wind blows and how things shift. We are not loyal to a party. We're loyal to Jesus, and no party, no party is fully aligned with the kingdom of God. None of them. And so with that, knowing no party's aligned with the kingdom of God, any law that you put in, in place is not going to change everyone's heart and mind and fix all of society. How should you vote? How should you vote? Uh, there's three things that I think that you should keep in mind when you're voting. The first is compassion over self-interest, justice over corruption, and love over fear. So let's talk about that first one, compassion. We are told as followers of Jesus that we should not just look to our own interests, but to the interests of others around us. That is how Jesus lived, and we are told that that should be our attitude at all times, to have the same attitude as Jesus. It is very easy to vote in your self-interest. It is very easy to vote in a way that benefits only you and props you up and, and makes things easier for you. But how can we vote with Jesus in mind? We can ask, how does my vote benefit my neighbor? 
How can my vote make someone else's life better? How does it impact others? You know, can it alleviate suffering? Can it bring about peace? Can it allow for dignity to be restored? How can I use my vote in a way that is beneficial to someone else? And then we talk about, talk about justice. And we said last week how justice and righteousness in the Bible, same word. When we see that, it's the same word. So if you want to be right with God, you also have to be living rightly with one another and seeking God's justice in the world. And so when we're thinking about our vote, can we say, how does this make the world right? How does, th how does this line up with how God wants us to treat one another? How God hopes that we would create a society that honors one another, helps us live rightly with one another. And with that, we have to be on the lookout for corruption. Now, I know you're all going to be like, well, they're politicians, right? None of them, none of them. I get it. I get it. But come on. The church needs to be way more sensitive to corruption than we have been. Because what's happened is we have lined ourselves up with a platform and a party, both sides, both sides, and we have started to, to ex justify and explain away behavior that we know is not right. And here's the reality. If someone is corrupt in their personal life, they're not going to be different in the public life. If they are self-serving in the way that they live over here, they're not going to be like, you know, I'm really voting for the greater good. I want to make sure I'm willing to put my reputation on the line to make sure that I'm taking care of others. Absolutely not. And what happens is each time we compromise our integrity by excusing away behavior that we know is not right, that we shouldn't be giving someone who behaves that way power and authority, each time we make a compromise and we make a compromise and we make a compromise, you compromise until you find yourself compromised. And that is the state of the church right now. The state of the church has compromised so much to align itself with political power that it has become compromised in our moral compass, in knowing right from wrong. Right? And so we, we should value character. It should be important to us. We should value character so much that if someone is so corrupt, we either we look at the other person and say, well, what can I agree with them? Maybe I can vote for them. If you can't, you just leave it blank. And Because the truth is, you don't have to cast a vote for a person, but we should not be okay to continually give people on the left and the right, both sides, people that we know act in a way that does not demonstrate character at all, giving them power and authority and trusting that they're going to act in our best interest. They absolutely are not. And so we need to choose justice over corruption every time. And then lastly, love over fear. And John says that perfect love drives out all fear. But here's the reality of political discourse. It's all fear-based. It doesn't matter what channel you're, you're turning to. They're all like, well, if they win, whoever they is, it's all going to end. Democracy is on the line. And the country's going to be destroyed. And you know, probably Satan's going to take over if they win. Like, all sides. All sides, right? And you're like, well, he's kind of already in charge a little bit as it is. So uh, I mean, we're just being honest here. Uh, but here's the thing. Fear. Fear makes it so you cannot be discerning. Fear makes it so you can't really discern between what's true and what's not true. And suddenly with fear, the enemy gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And we find ourselves reacting to enemies rather than loving our neighbors. And truthfully, many of us are more discipled by cable news than we are by the wisdom of Jesus. Many of us spend one hour a week in church listening to a sermon, and you think, good, check that off, got my wisdom of Jesus. And then we go home and we watch hours and hours and hours of television, or we watch TikTok videos, or wherever you're finding it, and we just, or we read different news sites, and we just are discipled in the way of fear, to be very afraid. But we said last week, God's kingdom is never in trouble. It is the unshakable kingdom. And so we should be asking questions about love, and love always seeks for everyone to flourish, for people around us to flourish. And so we should be asking, rather than I need to protect myself from this very big enemy that's going to destroy everything when I vote, two, how can my vote help people around me flourish, help society flourish, help bring about goodness and beauty? How could I do that? And so when we vote with compassion, justice, and love in mind, you could find yourself on either side of the aisle some of you are like, absolutely not. Nope, you're definitely on this side. You're definitely on this side. But the truth is, you can think through an issue and arrive at a different solution. But if you go into the voting box thinking, OK, this is what I'm motivated by. I'm motivated by compassion, justice, and love, then go ahead and feel free to vote however you want. You know, Because the truth is, no kingdom of the world is bringing about the kingdom of God. But no matter which way you vote, this is what I want you to remember. Do not go in to the voting booth and check a box and think you changed the world. 
Don't check a box and think you changed the world. You didn't. You didn't. That's not how Jesus has called us to change the world. Our hope is not in our vote. Our hope is not in our political platform. Our hope is not in a candidate. Our hope is not even in the laws of the land. That's not our hope. We've been saying over and over in this series, we are citizens, ambassadors, and heirs of the kingdom of heaven first. That's where we belong. And we are exiles and we are foreigners living in this land, creating outposts of goodness and beauty that point to this greater kingdom. And so we are called to something bigger than that. Your vote is not the way that we're called to change the world. Scott Saul says it this way. God gave us government to restrain evil and uphold the peace in society. He gave us the church to, among other things, champion the cause of the weak, heal the sick, feed the hungry, and show hospitality to people on the margins. That's our job. And for too long, the church has been lured into the promise that if we hold worldly power, we will be more effective. If we just work our way in and hold positions of authority and get the laws on the book that we want, we'll be more effective. But you know, when we look at the life of Jesus, who used worldly power to advance the kingdom, their, their thought of the kingdom of God, it was the religious authorities of the time. And you know what they did? They partnered with Rome and they murdered God. That's what they did. Take that in for a second because it's very easy to partner with the, king, with the powers of this world and think, oh, but we, we'll just compromise a little bit. And we'll just do this a little bit and then we'll get God's way. But we could very easily work against what God is doing and not even be able to see it because we have been lured in by the power of control. We think if we just are in control, then we'll change the world. But the truth is, the more that we have tried to wield the power of control, the more the world has changed the church and not for the better. The church is called to wield the power of influence. And that's not influence, guys, just control. Like, we're just trying to influence the, the powerful people, but really we're trying to control them. Influence means the witness of the gospel. It means living faithfully to the ethic of Jesus, no matter who's in charge. Because Jesus tells us what's going to matter when his kingdom comes, what he's going to value. In this parable, he says this, then the king will say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you invited me into your home. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you cared for me. I was in prison and you visited me. He says, whenever we do this to the least of those around us, th those with the least power, those with the least access to justice, those who have been cast aside and are on the, on the margins, we do that to Jesus himself, and that is part of his kingdom. Every time we do that, we are advancing his kingdom. You can do those things no matter who's in charge. The church was doing those things under a brutal dictatorship that was killing them, and that was expelling them, right? and that they had to go underground a lot of the time. You can live the ethic of Jesus no matter who is in charge, no matter which candidate gets elected. Because the church, when we rely on the power of influence, we change the world. And we've done it throughout our history. Let me give you one example of the early church. And there was a practice in the Roman Empire called exposure. And what that meant is if they didn't want, if someone had a baby and they didn't want it, either it was deformed, it was a girl, uh, they had too many children, they'd just leave it out. Leave it out, expose it to the elements, and it would either be killed by an animal or it'd be killed by the, the uh, elements, right? And that was a common practice. And you know what Christians did? They didn't go and say, you know what we need to do? We need to get positions of power in the Roman authority, Roman government, so we can, we can lobby and change that. You know, they, we need to change the laws on the book. No, they just started picking up babies and adopting them. They just, they just raised them. Didn't matter what they were, who they were. They just picked them up, and they were some of the poorest people in the kingdom because they had been ostracized, many of them. But you know what? They thought this is a human being made in the image of God, so we're going to raise them. And what happened? The more they did that, it started to expose the cruelty of that practice of exposure. And it changed the hearts and minds of Roman citizens, and it eventually changed the laws. But they didn't do it by seeking control. They did it by living the ethic of Jesus. That's what we're called to do, right? And so we have been saying this whole series, our job is to create outposts of goodness and beauty in every good and beautiful thing we do right here, right now, will be brought into the kingdom, that we're, that we're citizens, ambassadors, and heirs to God's upside down, peaceable, unshakable, eternal kingdom. That's our home. And yes, governments have a role to play. They do. They have a purpose. And we should be grateful that we live in a society where our government, for the most part, is just. Not for everyone, but for the most part. We live, and that we get a say. That's a, that's a great thing. But 
Jesus again shows us what our attitude should be around worldly power. Because at the end of his life, when he's standing before Pilate, right, who is embodying the power of the Roman Empire, the most powerful empire of the world, Pilate says, don't you know who I am? Don't you know what power I wield? I, I hold the power of life and death over you. And Jesus is like, big deal, big deal. Like, you know what? Any authority you have is from the Father anyways, and it's not going to last because he doesn't need to compete with Pilate. He doesn't feel threatened by Pilate. He says, my kingdom, you can't possibly understand. It is something so different than anything that you have known. Because here's the reality. Kingdoms of the world, their days are numbered. They are not going to last. They are not eternal. But God's kingdom is. And so God's plan has never, please hear this, never been to save the world, to save people, to save societies through worldly power. His plan has always been us from the beginning. It has been people who faithfully follow the ethic of Jesus, no matter where they find themselves, who's in charge, just or unjust, powerful or not, people who are so devoted to the kingdom of heaven that they're willing to lay their life down on the line for it. That's his plan. It always has been. And we can still be that. It doesn't matter who wins in this election because the kingdom of God is not in trouble. The kingdom of God is not dependent on who holds whatever station you put in mind. The kingdom of God is still moving forward and we can still move it forward no matter which way we vote. So go ahead, vote your conscience. Vote with love and justice and compassion in mind. You know, whatever you feel like is the best vote that will help the most people flourish, wonderful. But don't think that's what God has called you to do to change the world. He's asked you to change the world, to be an outpost of goodness and beauty wherever you find yourself and bring the kingdom of God and make the reality of heaven present right now so that people are pointed to it and they can't wait for it. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for your good plan to save and change the world, Lord. Forgive us for the ways that we have advocated our power, where we've given it over to the wrong sources, where we've begun to believe that lie that we need to be in control to change the world, Lord. And help us to turn back to you and how you lived and how you taught in your witness and example and the witness and example of the early church that we do not need to wield worldly power in order to bring about the kingdom, in order to change the world and change hearts and minds, Lord. Help us to come back to the position of influence through the witness of living your ethic rather than trying to control the state and mandate how people live, Lord. I pray that you would help us here individually and collectively to be this outpost of goodness and beauty, that people would look to us and say, man, whatever it is that they've got, whatever it is that they're doing, I want to be part of that. God, let us be citizens and ambassadors and heirs of your kingdom above all else. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.